it's at four o'clock, and uh, this is the, the first ten minutes is a continuation of uh, what I said before, uh, and then I will uh, go into a new subject. And one of the things that I want to uh, thank Pastor Peters for is his velvet hand, pal, uh, his iron hand, his hand of steel is very good and I approve of. When you have a, a plan, a, a thing like this, and you time it, and you have your speakers, and they should all finish at a given time, and they don't uh, finish, it louses the whole works up, and it makes it very hard. So every speaker uh, should keep track of his time. And I apologize for not keeping track of my time uh, before, and I ran with about 10 minutes more on that talk that should have been on the uh, videotape. So I will uh, put that on now. What I was uh, uh, had covered is that the uh, procedures that you would follow if you were in a court, and if the I said if the uh, you start off when the, when you with your original arraignment, and then the, what you say to the judge, what he will say to you. And this is all covered up to take up to the point that the judge uh, has declared it's a statutory jurisdiction. And uh, I said that that is as far as we've ever got any court to go. They have come to the point that they say this is a statutory jurisdiction, uh, Mr. Freeman. And uh, then at that point, uh, what you say is, thank you, Your Honor. Let the record of this court show that this particular criminal action against our Freeman is a criminal action under statutory jurisdiction. Now, if there's no interference from the court, you set that right into the record. Then you turn to the judge and say, uh, Your Honor, I do have another problem here. Uh, I have never heard of criminal actions under statutory jurisdictions. I'll be glad to accept that jurisdiction if you can show me the published rules or tell me where I can obtain them. the published rules of criminal procedure for statutory jurisdictions. Now, there is no published rules of criminal procedure for statutory jurisdictions. And uh, so he can't tell you where to find him, and he can't show it to you. And uh, at that point, we've had, we've run in cases where, uh, at that point, the case is just dismissed. In one case, uh, it reached that point when the prosecuting attorney was in the uh, uh, courtroom, and he said, uh, uh, I don't think there's enough merit in this case to waste my time in court court's time trying it, I move the case be dismissed. That was in a case, a member of E. Peter's church uh, who uh, had let his driver's license expire and uh, he had uh, not reinsured, uh, so he didn't have compulsory insurance on his automobile and no driver's license. But they didn't see enough merit in the case to try it, so it was dismissed. Well, that's where they've stopped so far. But the point is, someday we may get an attorney, a, a judge, to admit that they're operating as a condition of international contract under the criminal aspects of an admiralty jurisdiction, because that's his only other authorized criminal jurisdiction. And uh, so if you could ever get him, to admit it, uh, that uh, is fine. The minute he states it, thank you, Your Honor, let the record of this court show that this court has declared this particular criminal action against Howard Freeman is a criminal action under a statutory jurisdiction. And uh, uh, 
that sub is it. It's in the record. No objections. You've got it in the record. And oh, I, 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 I said that it's that sure I meant happy. Now, once that's in the record, then you turn to the court and say, well, you, Your Honor, you realize that no court in the United States has a criminal jurisdiction in admiralty unless there's a valid international contract in dispute. I'm not aware of any international contract. Will you have the prosecuting attorney? Uh, well, since I'm not aware of it, I deny that any such contract exists. Will you have this prosecuting attorney prove that there's a valid international contract in existence, that I'm a party to that contract, and my being a party to that contract obligates me to obey this statute? Well, that takes the burden off the judge's back, and it puts it on the prosecuting attorney's back. And the average prosecuting attorney at that point would give up. But suppose we have a spark. Suppose he really knows his business, and he gives away the secrets which they don't want given away. And he says, well, the way Mr. Freeman uh, came under this uh, jurisdiction uh, is the fact that Roosevelt made a contract in the name of all the people of the United States uh, for a bank credit and in 1938, America reached the point where there was not enough gold. He re promised to repay that bank credit in gold coin. In 1938, he did not have the gold coin to repay the debt that he had contracted. Therefore, uh, the American people went uh, into bankruptcy. And... Uh, they didn't, we didn't declare bankruptcy. We said we we're blending the procedures of law with the procedures of equity so we wouldn't swarm them. But that was really what happened. And at that point, uh, the uh, American people came under a jurisdiction of compelled performance. These statutes that you have seen passed and that Mr. Freeman is charged with violating are public policy statutes in the interest of the nation's creditors, and they are enforceable on the letter of the uh, public policy statute. And he is in violation of that public policy statute. Now, that he seems to have covered the justification for the admiralty jurisdiction. But here is your answer. Your Honor, I would agree that that jurisdiction would apply if the contract that Roosevelt made with the international bankers was a valid contract. But by the very law of nations that that contract was made under, uh, that contract is an invalid contract. The law of nations, the law of merchant, call it what you will, states that a valid contract uh, must be an interest contract. And uh, it is my contention that Roosevelt engaged in a no interest contract when he borrowed that credit from the international bankers. Now, what is an interest and what is a no interest contract? Yeah. I have one minute to cover this. Uh, to quickly to see it, why can I not take it? A fire insurance policy out on my neighbor's house. Well, the reason I can't is because the policy would not be enforceable in any court of law because I have no interest in that house. I have put up a, uh, a premium uh, to insure a house that I have no interest in. I hope the house burns down. Say it's a hundred thousand dollar house insured for eighty thousand dollars. I hope the house burns down. I gave four hundred dollar premium, and I hope it burns down before the years are. But you see, the man who owns that house, he does. He has an interest in it, that house not burning down, because if the house burns down, it was worth a hundred thousand dollars, and he's only going to get eighty thousand. The insurance company doesn't want to see that house burn down. 
They have an interest in the house. So they don't want to see the house burned down. And uh, that is what you would call an interest contract. By both parties have an interest in the subject matter of the contract. That house is a subject matter. And neither the insurance company nor the owner of the house want to see the house burned down. But I come along as a gambler, a gambling man, and I put up the premium and I insure the house. Now, if it burns down, I go to collect this $80,000 and I find that no court has jurisdiction to enforce an invalid contract. And so uh, I can't even get my $400 premium back. I'm out. I don't think the house burned down. I put $400 premium on. But the contract was an invalid contract, and no court is uh, empowered with a jurisdiction to enforce an invalid contract. So I'm just out of luck. Well, now let's see what kind of a contract Roosevelt made for the international bakers. Uh, when he made that contract for the international bakers, uh, that was a no-interest contract. That is unenforceable in any uh Admiralty Court or any court in the world. And so uh, my 10 minutes is up, but uh, that is enough to show why the uh, courts will deny uh, or never tell you that they're operating in an Admiralty jurisdiction. Because in a slightest traffic case, an overtime parking ticket, if you if they actually admitted that this came under an admiralty jurisdiction, this is compelled performance in the interest of the nation's creditors. If this were a public policy statute that's being enforced on the letter of the statute as a criminal action, that has to, if it's criminal, it's got to be international law because American equity is civil. And so if it's a criminal action, it's under international law. And if you, the only way that would uh, hold that jurisdiction would hold is if it were a valid contract, because no court has jurisdiction to enforce an invalid contract. So your argument in an admiralty jurisdiction is the contract is not a valid contract, and no court has. And you see, if the contract Roosevelt made with the international matters was not a valid contract, then the debt that America owes is a no debt. It's a void debt. There's no debt. And if the, the contract that he made is invalid, how can they tie me into an invalid contract claiming I'm a creditor of these bankers? You see, if I've got that into the court record that the, uh, the contract that had brought me under these public policy statutes was not a valid international contract, uh, then if the, that would mean that the United States had no debt, and if the United States had no debt, then I am at law as a freeman, and I am not under a jurisdiction of compelled performance as a person uh, in, under that jurisdiction. Well, uh, I've got that time. That ends up that tape. Now I have a little free time that I can, won't have to hurry so fast. I've got uh, 50 minutes now that I can uh, go at, at much more leisurely pace. I want that to, and uh, uh, now, since the, uh, the tape, videotape is off and everything, I can uh, have a little uh, easier time because there's a lot of material to cover there. And in fact, if I, there's some question that anyone has to have made clear on that, I, I'm afraid at this moment to answer that question. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Did I make the, the idea clear? How, why it is that no court will admit that they're operating under an admiralty jurisdiction. You see, ever since 1938, all what is called uh, law is not law. It's public policy in the interest of the nation's creditors. Our, if that debt that Roosevelt contracted with the international bankers was a valid debt, we have no rights at law. And every judge 
take silent judicial notice that all those people brought before him are bankrupts. They, uh, they have lost their rights of law, and now they can be compelled to perform in the interest of the nation's creditors. And it's just the same as any other bankrupt. If you go bankrupt, you have no more rights. You, the courts now say, you owe this man, this man, and this man so much money. When you earn so much money, you will give this man so much, you will give that man so much, you will give that man so much. And this court is deciding, uh, see, equity means fairness, as the court sees fairness. And fairness says, if you earn so much money, then you will give so much money each week to this man, this man, and this man. Failure to do so will be in contempt of this court, and you will go to jail. So you see, uh, you, you can get up and shout, well, I want my constitutional rights. The judge rightfully tell you, you have no rights in this court. You are under a contract. You entered into that contract voluntarily, knowing, knowingly, and intentionally, and I'm here to enforce the exact letter of that contract. And so uh, that's the way bankruptcy is enforced. You agreed to pay, you didn't pay, you're in default, you're compelled to perform according to, to uh, the public policy set by the court. Or in this case of a nation, when we're all citizens of a nation that's in bankrupt, then our nation is owned by the banks. And they tell our legislative bodies what public policy statutes to pass in their interest. You see, it's in their interest, for example. They say, well, these slaves are here to serve us. They, they owe us more than they've got. Now, dead men pay no taxes. And we don't want these men to die. We want them to work. And we've got to take taxes off them. So uh, these fools are driving around their automobile without buckling their seatbelts. And a lot of them are getting killed. We can't allow that. So tell the legislative bodies of America to pass public policy statutes in our interest requiring these fools to buckle their seatbelts. And if they don't do it, make them pay a $50 fine. So when you go into court, see, they will say, you violated the laws of this country. Well, that isn't law. Law does not compel performance. It's public policy. You violated a public policy statute of this country. And that public policy statute is enforceable on the letter of the statute. And you have no rights at law at all. You are under a jurisdiction of compelled performance in the interest of the nation's creditors. Now that is what we've been going. That comes under uh, IRS that comes under EPA, OSHA, or any of the other, any administrative agency of government, they're administrating this country in the interest of the nation's, the country's creditors. The country is really owned by the creditors. Now we can, they fool us and let us vote for presidents, and you vote for a Republican or you vote for a Democrat, but it doesn't matter which one you vote for, you get the same thing. You will enforce and do policy that the international banks want done. He is their puppet, and they don't care which puppets you want to choose. Now let's choose puppet A or puppet B, and you think you have a choice, but in either case, you're going to be compelled to perform in the interest of the nation's creditors. This is what we face in the world today. Now, it's around it. You see, George Washington envisioned in that vision, I hope most of you have read it, it's very worthwhile. But he saw America in the final days with our Constitution dangling by a thread. The thread is that they don't want to admit what they've done yet. They don't have the strength yet to admit it and just cut that Constitution right off. So they pretend that they have it. And so, well, this de facto government is pretending to be a de jure government. We can use the little thread of de jure government that we still have to our advantage. And that thread comes in the area of the Sixth Amendment. That's why 
worked out that procedure because I know that they're not going to give away their secret. We've tested it before. They will not admit that uh, their courts are admiralty courts. They have all the trainings of admiralty courts. They have a, a gold flag, a fringe flag in their courts. It's an admiralty court, but they won't admit it. And the reason they won't admit it, and this probably comes uh, through the federal judiciary. Now, I was at a hotel once that uh, usually I was able to go in and buy my breakfast. But this particular day, the hotel was surrounded by police, and they told me, you're not allowed in there. And I said, well, why? What's uh, going on here? He says, I always used to get my breakfast here uh, when I was in town. And said, what's, what's happened? They said, oh, you can get your breakfast here tomorrow. But today, the entire hotel has been taking over, taken over. It's a, a meeting all federal judges are, are meeting here, and it's secret. The public is kept out. Well, what can federal judges decide in secret meetings among themselves in a, a ritzy hotel? Well, they must be deciding uh, what they will take silent judicial notice of. Because, as I pointed out, the international bankers set up the international bar. The international bar set up the bar in every nation in the world. And the bar associate, the inter international bar set up the American bar, which set up the state bar in every state in the union. And it's the bar associations who license attorneys, and licensed attorneys become judges. So a judge is more concerned of pleasing his bar association than he is in pleasing uh, uh, carrying out his own to support the Constitution. So he's going to do what's in his best interest to do. And he has been told that the bar associations who uh, said to the people, we're blending the procedures of the law with procedures of equity, that what they really meant was that the people are bankrupts. Now you take silent judicial notice that these people that are coming before you are a bankrupt people. They have no rights. Now, if you want to give constitutional rights to a few criminals uh, to pretend that the Constitution exists, that's all right. You can give them 12 man juries. You can uh, uh, give all the terms of a common law uh, court if you want to do it. But you're no longer a judge sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States. You're a judge in equity. A judge in equity is a chancellor. A chancellor is a state-created God capable of determining good or evil, truth or falsehood, right or wrong. He has police powers to back up any judgment he makes in judicial immunity against any proven error. Judge. And so to please the bankers, he stays within certain forms, but he has a lot of leeway. Now, the, one of the forms is they tell you, well, if you've got a real out-and-out print, a rapist, a murderer, a bank robber, give them all his constitutional rights. This fools people into thinking that they still have their constitution. And then turn them loose on the basis of their constitutional rights. And then people would they'll be angry with their own constitution because these criminals are getting off scot-free on the basis of some technicality of the constitution. Then we get an excuse to say the Constitution is outmoded, out of date, and you turn the people against their own Constitution. But uh, you will take silent judicial notice that you're a chancellor, and you uh, can choose who you give constitutional rights to and who you deny them to. And so uh, you give the appearance of a common law court, but it's not the common law court, it's an animal court. Really. And so in an admiralty court, uh, even civil cases have criminal penalty. So uh, that is why, see, in admiralty, in admiralty and equity, the difference between the two, equity is uh, American law. It's contracts under American law, but admiralty is contracts under international law. So they're both the enforcement of contract is a civil action, but admiralty is a civil action with criminal penalty. 
And so that is where the criminal, that's why a, a failure to button your seatbelt can be called a criminal act. You see, it, now this is the thing that destroys those who say uh, you don't need to button, uh, you, you shouldn't buy your uh, license plates for your car, you shouldn't get a driver's license, so on. They are assuming that these licenses are under a state contract between you and the state, but that's not what the situation is. You may have a state contract between you and the state, but that would be enforceable as a civil action. And the state, if they try to enforce a contract between the state as a corporate body and you as a citizen, if they try to enforce that, the state could not use its own corporate court to judge its own court cause because they're a party to the action. And that would be a prejudiced court. And you could have that removed into a federal court. So that is why the state, for the, any offense, uh, doesn't use the contract that they might set up, as I pointed out, when you give up your right to drive, except the privilege to drive, that's a consideration. And then you show your agreement when you apply for the driver's license. And then they could say, well, now you have an obligation now to obey the motor vehicle code to the letter. It's a contract here between you and the state, and we're enforcing that contract. Uh, but that would be a civil action, not a criminal action. And the state could not hear its own cause because now the state is not speaking in the name of the people of a state, which would be a criminal action under the common law. They're speaking in the name of the state as a corporate uh, body. And so you have a corporate body against an individual on a contract between the corporate body and the individual, and the corporate body cannot use its own corporate courts to judge that. That would be a prejudiced court. And so you could remove that out of their jurisdiction. And so the states don't want you to do that. That's why they make that. And any traffic violations, even parking overtime, you're a criminal. But not a common law. Now, if, they, if it's, it's a common law jurisdiction that they're holding of you, well, yeah, say, thank you, Your Honor. Let the record of this court show that this court has declared that this particular action against your name is a criminal action under a common law jurisdiction. Now, once you've got that set in the record, you've got all your rights out of the Constitution, the Magna Carta, and everything else. And you can say, well, I hope the case be dismissed because there's no cause of action for a common law jurisdiction to exist. Where is the injured party? Uh, and if they can't produce the corpus collecti, there's no jurisdiction. There's no cause of action for a common law. So they're out. So that's why they won't say it's a common law jurisdiction. But what, where, how else can they get a criminal action out of it? They have to go. They can't use that state jurisdiction. That's a the state contract. That's a civil action. They've got to go into an international contract. And when they go into the international contract, then it's a condition of international contract under the criminal aspects of an admiralty jurisdiction. Ah, once they admit that, now all you've got to do is to, the one defense under admiralty is the, the contract is not valid. You deny the validity of the contract. And when you deny the validity of the contract, then uh, you can offer proof of why that contract is invalid. So you get the, the law that that contract was made of. That's the international law, law of nations. Find out what constitutes a valid contract under that law and what constitutes an invalid contract under that law. And we find that when Roosevelt borrowed the money, uh, credit he didn't, didn't borrow money from the international bankers, that was an invalid contract. Now, why? I guess I didn't explain this, so now I'll explain it. I was such a hurry to get done with that tape today. I didn't explain it properly. Why is that the invalid contract? Well, let's see what the international bankers gave us. <laughs> when Roosevelt went to them and he says, I need $120 billion to meet this year's uh, deficit. 
I collected $120 billion less in uh, taxes than I have spent. And so to, to make the books balance, I need $120 billion in uh, bank credit. And so the international bankers say, okay, you've got it. And uh, so he gives them an interest-bearing contract. And in that interest-bearing contract, he agrees to pay in gold substance for this bank credit that he received. So they, they gave nothing, but if America survives as a nation, they're going to get gold substance. But do they care whether America survives as a nation? They don't care whether it survives or falls, because if they don't get gold substance, they get real estate substance. They own the country. That's what's happened. They, they didn't uh, really worry when Roosevelt couldn't give them the gold coin, because now they own the country, and they own all the productive capacity of the country, and they get taxes as they please. But was that a valid contract that Roosevelt made with them? Did they have an interest in the survival of the country? No, it's a no interest contract, and no interest contracts are void by international law. And so that is the reason to see why they can't admit it's a national jurisdiction. And so uh, why bother to go to all the trouble of getting rid of your social security and, uh, and all of that stuff? Uh, I've got social security I'm collecting. But I know they're not going to admit that they're operating under an admiralty jurisdiction. So I know they're not. Uh, all I want to do, suppose, I got them to explain it. Suppose they explained it this way. They said, well, yes, uh, Mr. Freeman is under an admiralty jurisdiction. He's collecting Social Security. That, in addition to the fact that the nation is a bankrupt nation, uh, that puts him under admiralty. Well, how did Social Security get under admiralty? Well, he gets under admiralty on this basis. You see, if I'm a bankrupt, and there's a man over here that I owe more money than I have, but I agreed to send somebody else's child to college, the list man says, how come he's agreeing to send this man's son to college when he owes me more than he's got? He's not going to make that contract without money being a party to that contract. And that's exactly what they said. You see, the way Social Security becomes an inter, uh, under an international jurisdiction is it's not a contract between the United States government and its citizens. It seems to be a contract, but if the United States government is a bankrupt government, then the creditors have an interest in that uh, Social Security contract. And so that is how, so that this fellow would say, that's how Mr. Freeman got under an admiralty jurisdiction through the Social Security. Ah, but if the contract which Roosevelt made and got the country into debt is an invalid contract, what court has jurisdiction to enforce the invalid contract? And so you see uh, that uh, any argument you want to make to, to show that you're under an admiralty jurisdiction is going to underpin the bankers. That's why they have to have the judges' meetings so that they can take silent judicial notice of something that's never told to the public. And the public is deliberately kept in, in ignorance of this fact. Only the higher judges know this. But the Bar Association is probably at, at the top level of the book because they're getting their instructions from the bankers. But this is the way the uh, system operates, and we can take advantage of it because it's fraudulent. They know it's fraudulent, and they have to keep the secret covered. So as long as they have to keep the secret covered, well, I'll, I'll flaunt my Social Security. You know? so, well, yeah, I collect Social Security and make them prove that I'm under the Appleby jurisdiction on the basis of my Social Security. They're not going to do it. But if they do it, the whole banking scam will come right down on its head. We, America doesn't owe any debt. And our debts, maybe this year, year of Jubilee, 70th Jubilee since the founding of uh, Solomon's Temple, 
somebody will get this into court. All I would need to do is to get a state court to declare that they're operating under an admiralty jurisdiction because of the nation's debt or because of my social security. And uh, once they admit what, how they got that admiralty jurisdiction, then I would get into that court record the basis of that admiralty jurisdiction. And the court record becomes public. And I could advertise it to the sky. Do you know what happened to you, uh, people? And once the people know what happened, and that the contract that Roosevelt made in the Secrets is a fraud, well, the whole scam would be down the drain. So that is why this uh, uh, secrecy has to be about going around our court system. Well, now I want to go into another phase of things. If I've made myself clear, is there any questions that I didn't make myself clear? Okay, that, now you know why uh, it's not necessary to get rid of your social security number. It's not necessary to get rid of license plates on your car, driver's license, or any of these things. Because if you know how to ask the questions, you can force that court through the Sixth Amendment. There's our little string that the Constitution dangles by. Force them by that Sixth Amendment to give you the nature and the cause of this action against you. Or else they're operating under a secret jurisdiction known only to licensed attorneys and judges. And they can't, that in the record would look terrible. So they don't dare do that. And so they're going to dismiss the case before it ever gets that far. Now, I want to show you how uh, not to do it with certain things. Uh, this man here approached me. I've had several people approach me with various problems. And one man approached me, and he has a problem like this. His problem is that uh, he's sending his children to a private school, but he has to pay public school taxes. And he feels that the uh, government uh, should make him pay taxes for a service that he's not using. And uh, so he has refused to pay for the service. And uh, the court has come right now and right? says the law requires you to pay taxes. And uh, he has been ordered into court and he is told uh, that you of the law requires these taxes to be paid. And this is the way not to answer a situation like that. You can see here, he said, I'll just give you a little idea. I will, however, assert, admit, and yes, even shout from the rooftop, rooftops, that I am a Christian in the service of the great I am, that first and original that first and original lawgiver with the ultimate authority of this man, and certainly all matters related to his creation. I do can not consider myself, my Christian beliefs, to be watered down, extracted, mutilated, rich, and ethical, and goes on and on, telling what a, his Christian beliefs are and all that. That is garbage. Now, not what he says is garbage. I agree with his that the fact that he is a, uh, knows his identity, that he's a Christian and all that. But that is not the way you do things. And that's where, that is what I call a uh, Christian patriot. Now, he wants to save some money. And so now he uses Christianity as a prop to uh, save some money. And he tries to justify it, but it's such a cluttered mess that he'll never get anywhere. Now, suppose you were faced with this. How do you work on such a situation? Well, here's the way you work. There's overall principles that all governments have to operate on. They don't care whether it's even a communist government has to operate on. These are so universal. It's a universal principle that applies, it, that you see, it's a universal principle, whether you're a communist or you're a non-communist, that if you don't breathe and get oxygen in your lungs, you're going to die. 
But you get an overall principle that's going to cover this situation. Any country has got to recognize, well, this is its own principle. Or at work from that overall principle. Now, the overall principle that we're uh, dealing with in this situation is the principle of what constitutes a valid contract. And uh, now you see a valid contract by the law of nations, by American law, but by any law, a valid contract must be entered into voluntarily, knowingly, and intentionally by both parties. Because uh, you cannot have contracts that are not agreed upon by the people. Now, to see that clearly, think of uh, this man over here as being a carpenter. And I want a new roof on my house. And I decide what I want to pay for having that roof on my house. So I write up a contract and I say, for this amount of money, I want him to put a new roof on my house, according to my own specifications. And he looks at it and he says, I'm not going to do it. So I bring him into court. And I'm going to compel him to perform according to this contract that I wrote up. Here, here's the consideration. I gave him that consideration. Now you're going to be compelled to put a new roof on the house. Well, it's not a valid contract because he didn't agree to do it for that amount. You see, what I'm saying is that I can set my amount over here and I can write this contract up and I can compel performance over here. Do you see why the principles of what constitutes a valid contract for even Russia wouldn't allow such a thing. Because I say a ridiculously small sum here. Say so there's the consideration, now you've got the obligation. Now you need that third part of the contract, agreement. If you could set up two parts of the contract and enforce it, well, you see, that wouldn't be any contract at all. And every nation has to honor such a contract. There has to be three parts to it. Okay, now what is the, in this particular man's situation, occurring? Well, they will say that uh, you move into our territory. You're in our country. Now, uh, uh, when you're in our county, we have a right to set up any rules we want. And we are, we say that we're going to give you certain services and that you're going to pay for the cost of those services. And uh, you're free to move in our county or not. Well, that is not the way our Constitution allows it. We have a right to move around. Now, if the con county that you live in wants to set up a contract situation with its people, well, they can do so. But they still must render a service that is uh, agreeable with the people. Now they will say, well, if 51% of the people vote that we will provide the public education, then 100% of the people must uh, pay for it. And that would be the, now see, you always, when you study a situation, you want to see the opponent's point of view. This is the view that they're going to take. They're going to say, well, this is our county. You moved into this county, now you abide by the rules of this county. And, and that may sound quite reasonable. And uh, so uh, then you moved in there and temporarily you agreed and you went through it. But you see, the question is, does any corporate entity, a county is a corporate entity, has the right to set its own terms in a contract. Now you see, uh, suppose all the counties of the United States set their terms of a contract in such a way that they could, uh, for very little consideration, have a tremendous obligation on the part of the people. Well, that would not be justice. You see, a just contract must be voluntarily entered into by both parties. Now, what the county is doing 
is providing a very inferior quality of education and charging an exorbitant price for it. And they say, you will accept our school system and you'll pay for it. Now, if you want a better education, go buy it somewhere else. Well, now you see, what you have to do is take the specifics of the situation and set it in an overall general principle. Now, the overall general principle involved is uh, would any corporate body in any nation of the world have a right to set its own terms of a contract? And, uh, well, they would say, oh, but we didn't do that. You see, we're, we're setting the terms, but we set it by people who are voted. And if 51% of the people vote to accept this thing, uh, fine. Well, uh, they keep the 51% of the people uh, fooled most of the time. But uh, the United States Constitution uh, is not a democracy. That is, we are a republic. And our republic looks after the least important person in the country. You know, one of the things I love is when I have these liberal Jews uh, talk and say, we're uh, democracy, we're for democracy. I say, gee, it's strange that you're for democracy because uh, in a democracy of 51% of people voted to uh, exterminate all Jews, uh, you'd be exterminated. I thought you didn't like Hitler. That, that was the kind of thing that uh, he was promoting. I can see a republic protects you against that. And uh, so you see, you just take their own thing and exaggerate a little bit and they see the fallacy of that this is America is a democracy. And then no Jew will be hollering for democracy once he realizes that 51% of the people could vote him out of existence. Because that is 51% of the people determine the supreme law of the land. And uh, so you see, a republic protects each individual citizen against injustice. And that is what our federal constitution is. So now you're going to take this out of that county's hands because the county is a corporate body and they have a county corporate court to do ju judge their, their contracts. And so what this man needs to do is to say, well, I believe that uh, justice uh, requires that this uh, dispute be brought out of the county level and into the federal level. I want a neutral court to decide whether my rights uh, are being violated by the contract which this uh, corporate body is compelling upon me. Now, there may be many people who like that corporate contract. But the Constitution of the United States is to protect the individual person in all of his rights. And so, as an individual, I uh, bring my case into a federal jurisdiction. And you see what happened in the Amish case. The Amish are not bothered by the community. They're not paying taxes and they're allowed to educate their own children. You see, they got it out of the county level. They got it into the federal level. And you see, you start with your overall principle. What would it be like if any corporate body or any individual could make a contract and compel performance on the contract without having agreement? You see, that uh, nobody could say See, that's, uh, you can see, you can destroy even Russia with such uh, uh, the overall principle. So even the communists uh, uh, acknowledge contracts, the validity contract, and contract has to have three parts. There has to be a consideration, there has to be agreement, there has to be an obligation. And you see what the county is doing in the case of these school systems. They are... Uh, they are saying that uh, this is law that you are required 
on the videotape, so I can put it in that. You see, what was bad about the videotape was that uh, a videotape speaker puts in the middle of it helping you sell it to somebody. It just gets the most interesting part of the thing and it's cut off like that. But what good is that videotape? So I had to get that other 10 minutes on there so that the videotape would be the sale that completed the thing. I had to go too fast to give you the proper information. And that's one of the reasons, uh, the reason I go out and speak, that I don't want to give just enough information to get somebody into trouble. And that's why it's so hard to give a big subject into a small space. And uh, what I should do, and I learned my lesson this time, I won't do that again. I'll just narrow my subject down to a small aspect of it. But I'll do a good job on what I do so that the, that part of it people will see clearly. But if you try to cover too much, you can, it's a temptation to, to tell a whole lot and to help them in many areas. But when you do that, you can't do it clearly enough that they understand it enough and they go out uh, half cock. Now, one of the things that happens, one fellow uh, came up and he went into a court. Uh, and, uh, well, he says, I couldn't remember all you said, but I said, I remember some of what you said. And so he says, uh, I asked the court, uh, uh, is this uh, a case against me under uh, uh, common law or admiralty law? Well, you see, admiralty is not law. Uh, that's where a fellow can make a fool of himself in the court. Admiralty is a jurisdiction. The law that's being tried under an admiralty jurisdiction is the law of merchant or the law of nations. Admiralty is the jurisdiction under which that's being tried for a maritime uh, admiralty. They're both jurisdictions. The law is the law of nations, the law of merchant. But you see, the fellow, he hears something, and if you don't have time enough to go in and explain these things, the first thing you know, he goes off, he thinks he's got a lot of information, and he, he can wind up losing everything, wind up in jail or something. So that is why I, I really, uh, I get over my time every time if I don't watch myself, because it's so easy to uh, extend it to more areas. And if you're dealing with people who are very well schooled with law, well, you can cover ground fast. But when you are going with people who are really in the beginning stages, you've got to go step by step. And even now, what I've been able to do here uh, is not building the quite the background that I should. Uh, I haven't explained how the, the origin of admiralty. How is it that admiralty, which is a uh, civil act, that is civil enforcement of contracts, how did it get criminal penalty? See, now that's background material you need to know. I can tell you that there is criminal aspects of enforcement of contract violations in that jurisdiction. There is no criminal aspects in enforcement of contracts under an American equity jurisdiction. Now, uh, I think maybe in the time I'll explain that a little detail. See, that I keep thinking of well, this should be explained. That, that, that. All these little things that you need the background on to build. But uh, I just like every patriot to know some of these things. Because if you do a little digging on your own, you'll come up to all of the information you need. That's the way I did it. Uh, I had to dig it all out. And so uh, I'll help others. Uh, did you have a question? Oh, three parts of the contract. Yeah. There always has to be a consideration. That is the money you pay. Now, here's the rule for over here. I have to give him some money. If I didn't give him any money, I couldn't, uh, there wouldn't be any contract. I couldn't just say, well, you're in a roofing business, put a roof on my house. You see, uh, you, you have to have a, a three parts. The first part, I've got to pay and consideration. The second part, I always think of it like a scale. 
I always look up and look down with a hand out like that. It's the scale. And the uh, fulcrum there is the agreement. And when he agrees to put my roof on for that price, now he has the obligation to put the roof on, and he has the obligation to follow every letter of that contract to the dot. And he has no rights. I guess I gave that example yesterday where he uh, couldn't do it in time, so he put paper shingles on instead of wood shingles. And then he gets into court and he says, well, I couldn't get the wood shingles. And he wanted it done in three weeks. And these cost me just as much money. And what's he grouching about? And, but the judge looks at it and he says, but the contract calls for wood shingles. You will tear out the paper shingles off and put wood shingles on. But he says, I can't use those paper shingles on there. And they're taking a rule of them, and it's a cloth, and it's from the garbage. And it, it would bankrupt me to put the wood sheets. The judge says, you will take those paper shingles off, and you will put the wood shingles on. See how cold what is the, the contract enforcement is? It's enforced on the letter of the contract. And see, that's what they're doing with all of what they call law. It's not law at all. It's public policy. It's contract obligations that are enforcing it on the letter. When you, if he comes up and says, well, don't I have any constitutional rights? And the judge bangs his devil, you will not mention the Constitution in this court. See, the Constitution gave you unlimited power to contract. He made a contract, or I made a contract with him. Uh, and now there is, uh, uh, you're within the Constitution, you're, you're under contract. But you see, this is the thing that they are using our Constitution, the part that allows us to make contracts, but they are sneaking these contracts onto us that we don't know about. They call it implied contracts, all this kind of adhesion contracts. They've got all kinds of names, but there has to be a contract. And every contract to be valid must be entered into, but there must be a consideration, agreement, and obligation. Or you enter it knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally. See, it is said that knowing voluntarily attention. I think that was the three words in mind, whether consideration, agreement, and obligation. But those are the characteristics, and it doesn't matter if you're dealing with an American contract. Oh, yeah. Okay, I guess I'd like to. Well, we've got uh, well, five minutes is to five, and at 5.15 is the... Uh, yeah. Well, 5.15 is the absolute cutoff. Do it at five. Uh, do it at five. Uh, do, it, do it. Do it. At, turn it off at five o'clock. Five o'clock. We'll turn it off. All right, Charlie. We got three minutes. Is there any question yet? Yeah. Tell her about the tape. From David. Uh, what? What you say? Is there any additional information besides the tapes? Oh, yes. I have tapes. Uh, uh, I was over at Penn Gaines in early May, and he's got six hours on tape. Oh. And so any of you want to uh, uh, get uh, more tapes, see there I had, uh, I went into uh, how she can survive a wolf country, and I had split it in three ways. Uh, one way, uh, dealing with sorcerers. How to understand sorcery and how it works. And you'll understand your Christianity 10 times better when you understand that. Then I took it under the realm of economics. Now, no man has the right to destroy unless he can build it. No man has the right to be against taxes unless he can show how to finance government at every level with nothing that fits the definition of a tax. And that's on tape that Dan's got. Two hours. I'll show you how to finance government at every level under the perfect law of liberty, James 125. Whosoever looks into the perfect, not good, perfect law of liberty and continues there in being not forgetful here, but in doing the word will be blessed in the doing. It's a perfect law of liberty. You can finance government at every level without anything that fits the definition of a tax. What is the definition of a tax? a compulsory levy upon production for the support of government. Did God ever condemn production? 
No, God tells us to go out and produce. If we don't produce, we shouldn't eat. And yet, men make laws, which they call taxes, making a crime of producing. Is there a perfect law of, of liberty if you have, if men have to make crimes of producing in order to support government? No, there's a way of financing government without anything that fits the definition of a crime. Uh, and uh, that is on another uh, 90 minute cassette. And then there's a 90 minute cassette on this law aspect of things that I, I have mentioned today and my time is up. So, uh, but if you want the address of Dan Gagan, see, I have it right here. And uh, I can give you an, uh, a $3 to take, $9 to take all three tapes for a while. Oh, okay. Okay. Nope, it's But, well, I, I do have his address. I had a flyer. He's going to have a meeting there in October. A piece of town house. And uh, that is uh, on uh, the address is on that. But let me see if I can't find his address. Shell City. He's tired of here. Let's so we'll have some of them. <laughs> you get it later. I'll, I'll uh, you should, uh, get a hold of me and I'll get it to you. I can look it up, but I think I should dismiss you because it's they want to everybody else. <laughs>